Yeah, so okay. Um, last time we started with statistical modeling, and almost finished, so we left off with the exercise, so you can already start your binder if you want to do the exercise, while I do a quick recap. So we learned what statistical modeling means in general, how to do a general linear regression, and then we focus on the simple linear regression where you only have a single predictor and an intercept. And then we learned how we could fit this model in Python using various ways, and then in the end how we could also do it in stats models using a simple formula syntax. And then we talked a lot about that I should actually execute some of those cells, otherwise in the end. Uh, will not work again, okay. So we learned how we can generate design matrices with Patsy, then how we can fit the things with stats models. And then we talked a lot about uh, how we can interpret the parameters that fall out of the linear regression. Yeah. Okay, and yeah, we talked about effect size, how this is probably the most important property, then how we can quantify our uncertainty about the parameters that we got. So explained, uh, no, first explained variance, okay. And then the sampling, we introduced the sampling distribution and how we can understand these uncertainty measures based on the sampling distribution. So how we can use standard error and confidence intervals just based on the uh, sampling distribution. And then we talked about the general idea of resampling, how we could also generate a sampling distribution from only a single sample. And we showed that it's like totally possible to derive the same or to arrive at the same numbers using these computational techniques and when comparing them to the analytic methods that stats models uses internally. And then we talked about null hypothesis testing, how this can be understood in a uh, comparable computational form, uh, framework, how we can also just uh, simulate data from the null hypothesis and then compare to our real data and see how much of the uh, samples from the null hypothesis show a stronger effect than the observed data. And based on this, we estimate the p-value and say, okay, how likely is it that we observe the data only by chance and that it in fact comes from the null hypothesis and not from some special other from the real hypothesis that shows some effect. And then finally we talked about assumptions that we make when we use linear regression. So based on the formula or like based on the idea that we assume uh, only errors from a normal distribution with fixed variance, a few assumptions follow that we can visually check. So checking the, that the response is in fact linear, that the re residuals are independent and don't show any structure anymore, then that the residuals are also normally distributed. For this we can use, we introduce the QQ plot that plots the theoretical against the sample quantiles and if the points don't follow a straight line then probably the residuals do not follow a normal distribution. And then we looked at equal variance at, oh uh, yeah, the data should also have equal variance and then also the residual should have equal variance. And then we left off with a final exercise where we, so we did some previous exercise on the tip data set where we uh, tried to uh, understand why different people give different amount of tips. And we used linear regression also for that. Now you should check if the assumptions for linear regression actually hold on this data set. So yeah, please try it out now. And then we'll see what the result of this is, if it was actually valid to do linear regression.
Wie ist die Lüfte? Ist die, also die sehr in Ordnung zu denken? Mhm. Äh, ich muss das hier so sehen. Ja, ich warte dann und dann habe ich halt noch Origin, weißt du, was ich mache? Okay, ich muss kurz mal. Aber du bist doch jetzt gerade gar nicht in einem Ort, ne? Oder? Ja, ich bin wieder da. Okay. Lass mal LS machen. Ja. Ja, okay. Und da geht's wohl immer. Also nichts gibt es da jetzt ja. aus. Okay. Ja, also du musst, wenn du geht, benutzen willst, immer in einen Ordner gehen. Ja, denn also ich habe da halt Origin Nach dahinter geschrieben. Äh, Origin den Namen hingeschrieben, weil das habe ich auch noch wahrscheinlich. Und welchen Namen meinst du? Black Hills, das ist ein Ordner. Ja, okay, das funktioniert nicht. Also was du halt machen kannst, also wie gesagt, geht guckt immer sozusagen, der ist ja quasi hier. Okay, das natürlich nicht. Ähm, hier liegt ja so ein Git folder so eine, und ja, da genau. ist quasi die ganze History drin. Du musst quasi immer irgendwie in dem Ordner mindestens sein, damit Git funktioniert. Yeah. Du kannst halt Git-Pull machen, also wenn du mal, weiß nicht, gerne guck hier. Hier sind quasi alle Remote Repositories hinterlegt, mit denen das irgendwie zusammenhängt. Da siehst du ja, dass die hinterlegt sind. So. Und wenn du jetzt nur Git-Pull machst, dann wird das per Default genommen. Du kannst halt noch mit Git-Pull, also die Syntax danach wäre noch entweder welches, welches Remote du willst, da ist halt der Name hier Origin. Und dann auf welchem, von welchem Branch du. Und dann hätte ich das HTTPS irgendwas halt erscheinen. Nee, dann hättest du Git Pull Origin Master schreiben müssen. Also das heißt, du willst sozusagen Git Pull von diesem Remote und dann vom Master Branch pullen. Ah, okay, okay, cool. Okay. Jo, gerne. Okay, so does anybody have results on, do you think it was valid to use linear regression on the data set? Apparently not, so let's check um, the solution. So what we should always do is do a residual plot, right, and if we do the residual plot we see that we Again, forgot to execute something above here. Um, yeah, so we should do it. So this is a residual plot for uh, the TIPS data set. So do you think this looks like it's supposed to look? No. <laughs> Why doesn't it? <laughs> what? Mm, yeah, but scattering all over the place is not exactly the problem. I mean, like you want your data to don't have any structure anymore, more or less, right? So what is like what assumption do you think is violated by? Looking at this plot. Mm, yes. About for the equivariance? Yeah, exactly. So we see that as the total bill increases, so there's a greater variation in how much tip people give. So maybe we can also un understand this in an intuitive way. When you only have like a small bill, you say, okay, I give like 10% and there's not such a big range, but if you really like pay a lot, then you might give like more or less uh, much uh, tip in the end. And we can also verify this again when looking at the QQ plot. Hmm. What did I import this as here? API, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here we see the same that like in the tail, so to say the 
sample quantiles deviate from the theoretical quantiles, so that there's more uh, probability mass here than there should be. So, so I think this is a nice example of why the QQ plot is like a useful tool because you directly see this deviation. So while well here you could say, okay, is this really systematic or so, you have to think, uh, have to look a bit more closely, but I think here it's very obvious. So and this might also explain why we, like when we try to reconstruct the results for the confidence interval and the standard error using bootstrapping for the TIPS data set, we didn't get exactly the same results as we got from stats models because stats models computes them in an analytic way and it assumes that uh, all these assumptions are correct. So if you can make these calculations under assumptions that do not hold, you might get different results when you just like sample computationally. So actually the results that we got by bootstrapping, I would say might be more correct than what we got here from stats models. Okay, so this is, by the way, I should, maybe not so big, okay. Okay, so this brings us like to the last um, topic, which is multiple linear regression. So until now we only very, um, talked a lot about in detail how to do linear regression with a single predictor. But now we want to extend this to multiple predictors. And for this, we will use a different data set, which is the weather data set. So weather in Seattle, uh, which I think we already had also in the lecture. We have some date, we have precipitation, we have maximum minimum temperature, wind, and then some categorical variable for weather. And we can look at uh, the relations between those variables using a pair plot here just really quickly. And we see that well, most variables are like at least uh, somewhat correlated so that you see at least some distribution. And I think what is, has the strongest correlation, uh, not very surprisingly, is the maximum, the minimum temperature of the day. So this always almost has a you know, strong linear co correlation, I would say here. Well, for example, wind and minimum temperature apparently does not really correlate, just like a giant blob here. So what we now would like to do, we say, okay, we want to uh, predict the precipitation or the amount of precipitation, uh, which by accident is also part of my PhD project uh, where we try to predict precipitation using deep learning and not using a linear regression. So in case anyone is interested, I'm happy to accept like thesis proposals or so. Uh, however, for now, we just stick with linear regression and we'll do just here again the OLS and now we say, okay, we want to predict precipitation from two predictors using the maximum temperature and the wind. So we could say probably if the temperature is higher, it doesn't rain so much in the summer or and when the wind is stronger, maybe it rains more or less, whatever. So and what we do here to combine these two predictors, we just use a plus between those two variables. So that's very simple, one could say. To and then we can just proceed as before. And what we now get here in this table is like uh, an extra entry that shows us the coefficient for this extra predictor. So what just basically happens under the hood is that we get now a new column in our design matrix that includes this variable as well. And then you just like get an extra, an extra slope, so to say, for, um, the, <coughs> for the extra variable. So and what we can see here, um, the effect of wind, uh, where well the effect of temperature is probably not so strong, but a bit negative, which makes sense. If it gets warmer, it probably rains less, and for wind, it is a bit stronger. Um, and yeah. And now what we can also do is we can use uh, the plot fit to see how good uh, our predictions match up with the uh, with the predicted values, or no, with the observed values. So what this what this, this does here, you give it the fit object and you give it one variable that you want to make the plot against. And then we see here as wind increases, these are our predictions that we make and these are the actual values. And we can see that there's a lot of structure in the data so that we have a lot of precipitation here in the middle that we cannot really predict using this linear regression. This is just doesn't matter. So this is if you want to include include an extra predictor using uh, that is continuous. However, it's also possible to include categorical data in linear regression. 
And for us, luckily, the syntax again doesn't change. So all we have to do is add an extra plus and the extra variable here. However, this cannot be just done by adding an extra column to the design matrix because you cannot really compute based on categories. So what happens under the hood here is that these category uh, or these categories are somehow encoded in a numerical way. And we look at the design matrix um, to understand what happens there. So first, if we look at the graphical representation, we see now that we have a lot more columns and we will turn this into a data frame to see this a bit better. So what happens here for the weather condition, we have like uh, two, three, four, five different conditions in fact. And what happens now is that for each of those um, conditions that could possibly be there, an extra column is introduced in the design matrix. And by default, a so-called one-hot encoding is used. Uh, that means that the, the column that is uh, where the condition is met is set to one and all others are set to zero. So for example, in this column, you could say it was probably weather rain and then uh, this column is set to one and all other entries that relate to this weather term are set to zero. So now you also, also notice that, for example, in the first column, all uh, in the first row, all columns are set to zero. And this doesn't mean that there wasn't any weather at all. But what this means is that, uh, if let's say weather dot weather dot root, uh, root does this. Yeah. So these are all the possible values. And we see that we don't have a column for drizzle, if I'm right here. Yeah. And this means because uh, this can also be encoded in the intercept. So this means if all those uh, if all those terms are zero, then this means okay, because we have this extra intercept here, we can this parameter, so to say, doesn't give us an extra degree of freedom. So one condition of all the categories is by default always left out. And in the case that you have some uh, interpretation of these categories, so let's say you make a psychological experiment and then you have a basis condition where you don't uh, give any stimulus or so, and then you have a lot of other conditions where you give different stimuli, then it makes sense to use, uh, to encode this basis or this basic condition where you don't show any stimuli as a zero. So this is the baseline, then you can see, okay, if I add, if I add any stimuli, what is the effect of this in comparison to that? So in this case, this is not really meaningful, and there could also be other encodings where you say you give uh, each one uh, encoding of, I don't know, minus 0.5 or something that this in the end will match up to zero again, but this is the default and this is also most of the time useful. So we just do this and fit the linear regression to this and then we see that for each of those possible conditions we get now an extra variable with an extra coefficient and so and what we also see that a lot of those things are not really significant anymore. So for example, sun apparently doesn't really, doesn't really seem to be significant if there's a p-value of 0.8. And how you can imagine this is because you just have like this fixed uh, value that is uh, either one or zero that you now have extra uh, intercepts. So for each of those categorical entries, you have now an extra intercept. And if you look at the data, we can see this here a little bit. You will have like for each of those categories, you will have an extra line or like extra lines that go parallel but are offset by different uh, values. And now the final thing is interaction. So what also can happen that uh, not only also, in, yeah, what can happen is that uh, the slope or the influence of a predictor changes based on the presence of another predictor. So what could possibly be that wind, uh, that the influence of wind is different based on the weather that we have. So if it's sunny already and there's a lot of wind, then probably there won't be more rain. But maybe if it's already cloudy and the wind shows the clouds or whatever, then uh, it could influence the rain stronger. And to model these conditions, what you can do is include a so-called interaction term. So the syntax for including this in the formula is just you say uh, predictor colon other predictor. 
so both the continuous and the categorical one. And what will then happen in terms of the design matrix is simply that uh, these terms will be uh, multiplied. So you say, no, for each of those terms, again, you add an extra column to the design matrix, and then you just multiply the wind column with the respective uh, categorical column. And this then, in the end, means, okay, we can, yeah, I think this is, ah, yeah, and so for, for shorthand syntax, what you can use, because usually you want to include both the predictors as they are, and then the interaction as well, so you can just say wind times weather, and this will be equivalent to the syntax here above. So saying this will expand to wind plus weather plus, plus wind colon weather, or wind interacting with weather. And then if we fit this, we see that we get extra, a lot of extra terms now, which now really stop to be significant <laughs> on a large scale. And if we plot the prediction, we see now that we have different lines that also have different slopes. So this is how you can imagine interaction that you now have, yeah. can have different slopes based on the condition that you are in. Okay, so as a final exercise, we will for now ignore that uh, total bill doesn't really satisfy the assumptions of a linear regression and we'll just continue to use it. So let's try to predict the total bill by the variable day, smoker, and size, and also the interaction between smoker and size. And then you could also think about whether it makes sense to include those additional parameters.
Yes, okay. So what were your results? Do you think it makes sense to include those additional predictors? Okay, let's see. So if we have here the day, so in this case depends on the date. Yeah, as we said, so the day doesn't really make sense. So apparently, there's no, not much influence. But like, what did you get for the for the smoker? Okay. Okay, so I would say like a p-value of this is still a bit high. So I mean, what we should aim for. Everybody aims for at least like five percent, so this is like twice as high. So probably it's not so useful. And well, but the influence is quite strong. Yeah, depends. So, but also looking at the explained variance, I mean, you can compare this to the um, the original fit. So it's like 45%, and now we have 47, so probably adding like uh, through two additional variables and the interaction term, and then only getting such a small increase. Could say like, okay, this probably isn't worth it. Okay, with that, we are already at the end of this lecture, so we don't have any more time to go into like more statistical topics because it would be own lecture of its own. However, what I would recommend is like some further topics that you might look into is like generalized linear models. So how you can extend linear regression to other probability distributions such as Poisson processes or stuff. And then also linear mixed effects models where you can uh, include the effects of uh, repeatedly sampling from the same participants. So what that is often also done in experiment that you sample the same subject more often and then you somehow need to uh, account for this and this you can do with this and then there's also more general topics of model comparison and time series analysis and then general Bayesian statistics which is a whole different view on statistics itself but uh, you can do most of this also using stats models, Bayesian statistics there are extra packages in Python 4 that do this very well. And what I would recommend to you is to keep an eye open for courses from the neurobiopsychology. So they usually do a lot of statistics and also very good courses on these kind of statistics. So this is very recommendable. And finally, I have some further readings as usual. So some of uh, the concepts here were taken from a talk or a book by Alan Downey. Like he's a professor, I don't know, in US somewhere. But he does, uh, is also very active in the Python community. And yeah, he has a very nice talk about like how you can make intuitive statistics. And he also has a book that you can read for free. So let's try if this opens. Yes. So you can just download the PDF and read it. And it's like very, I think, very nice and also very entertaining. And he also has a talk and a book on Bayesian statistics. So if you want to get started with Bayesian statistics, I would also recommend looking into this here. And then the package for doing like really uh, advanced Bayesian statistics would be PyMC3. Uh, there's also a whole tutorial from PyCon where you can learn to do this. And then finally, there's another talk by Jake van der Plaas, which is like a short version of this lecture and like it talks about other computational techniques where you can like how you can use Python to understand statistics better. So with that uh, I would say this is for it and um, yeah what I should also do and forget again was showing the uh, solutions to the homework. So unfortunately again there were like most problems with the homework uh, came from uh, different font renderers and different operating systems, not from plotting itself. However, we just quickly go through the solution. So um, I, you were supposed to reproduce these three plots here. So first the violin plot of different groups, then the regression plot here, then some faceting, and then this density plot. And 
Uh, yeah, so the solution with ggplot, I think, were most intuitive, where you could just say add the violence, add the jittering, then add the summary in red. And here you would say, okay, map to the respective aesthetics, then uh, add the points and add smooth with a linear model here. And then for the faceting, it was similar and then just say facet wrap by the species. And then for the uh, part where you had to use Seaborn, you had to figure out the right arguments a bit, so uh, I think the mapping was also not the problem, but then you had to use color G, which apparently is different from color green, which disagree from green, which is a bit strange. And then you could specify, uh, you could customize the marginals using these marginal keywords where you say, okay, you want the distribution to look cumulative and don't have a shade. Yeah, that would be it. And so with that, I could also introduce today's homework if you want to or like do you already started or anyway so let's see if this would be would be this and here the task here we again turn to the cast data set and your task would be to first do a simple linear regression uh, using Patsy and stats models where you explicitly construct the design matrices uh, using Patsy and then do a linear regression using stats models and then return both the two design matrices and the regression result so in this case, we would try to predict miles per gallon, so the fuel consumption from the horsepower of the cars. And for all of those tasks, it makes also sense to interpret your results, so to not just blindly execute the code, but also think about a bit what this means in terms of statistics and whether you think uh, this shows a strong effect or whether you think the, uh, the relation is significant or whether you think there's no relation. And then the second task would be multiple regression where we now try to predict mi the miles per gallon from horsepower weight in uh, whatever this unit is from weight and origin, which is a categorical variable. And in this case, you just have to return the regression results, so you could also use the formula syntax here and should in fact do this. And then the final exercise involves a bit more coding. That would be to do bootstrapping again and what we try to do here is compare two groups of uh, cars, so or the eight-cylinder cars and the six-cylinder cars. And what we try to do here is to say, okay, whether uh, their fuel consumption is significantly different or how much different it is. So you should uh, try to compute the mean of those two groups and then compute the difference. And you should do this using, and then you should use bootstrapping to try to estimate uh, the standard error and the confidence intervals of a 95% confidence interval using bootstrapping. Yeah, and for this, you should uh, watch out that you also, when you resample, that you resample the two groups individually. So they, stick, they keep the, or the data set that you get has the same distribution as before in terms of cylinder cars so that you do not mix them and then resample so you get a different distribution there. So, and you should uh, bootstrap like for a thousand iterations and yeah, then return the both the effect size, the standard error and the confidence interval bounds and in case you are stuck with that using bootstrapping, you could also try to use stats models to get those numbers, but uh, I would prefer that you do it using like plain Python or like plain NumPy ones so that you again develop a better understanding of the bootstrapping procedure. Okay, so then you can start and if you have any questions, just say something. <coughs> 